Good afternoon. We want to welcome you to our panel discussion for this day. This is our education Sabbath. We want to welcome the online viewers. We welcome all our sisters and brothers in church this afternoon. And uh, we want to say happy Sabbath. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Lord for giving us the blessings of rain, even as we want to discuss a very interesting topic, the topic Christian education in modern times. Christian education in modern times. Before we start, I will ask our elder to pray, and then I will introduce the members in the panel. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, this very hour we want to come to you to ask your presence even in our discussions. Father, we are glad that you are with us in the morning even as we listen to your message. Now this afternoon, Lord, we invite you to be with us. We pray for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit even as we discuss matters to do with education. Father, we know that you are the first educator, and Father, we pray that we may be schooled in your feet. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I will ask uh, the panelists, welcome. I'll start with the panelists at my far left to introduce himself. God is good, all the time. Know the time. My name is Wilson Jenga currently the principal Maxwell Adventist Preparatory School. I am a teacher by, by choice and by profession with 19 years of experience in teaching. God bless you. Karibu sana, principal. Happy Sabbath. My, my name is Yukabeth uh, Majiwa. Um, I'm a member of the education committee in this church. I'm also in the deaconet. And uh, by profession, I'm also teaching, uh, not by choice, uh, but by circumstances. <laughs> yes, so I've been uh, lecturing uh, for the last seven years. Thank you. Karibu sana. My friend, I want to uh, ask the panelists to introduce himself. Uh, my name is Mark Rotich. I am... Um, an elder in this church. I also um, represent education department at the pastoral council. I am also the chair of our school, the board chair of our school. I know some of us know that we have a school in Saikeri. I'm the board of management chair. I am also in the education sector and I have been there for a long time. So I generally provide um, advice to governments on matters of education. Thank you. Mm, we are comfortable because we have able panelists. My name is Nancy Odiambo. I'm welfare leader this year, and I'm also a, deaconet, a deaconess in the deaconess department, and I'm a teacher by profession. I love being a teacher. Karibuni sana. Okay, so the, uh, the first question that I want to ask our elder, even as we are talking about Christian education in modern times, what is Christian education? Um, let me start by saying the most obvious thing, uh, so as we set the scene. Um, education is actually a systematic instruction given in various forms. It could be given in schools, it could be given at the university, it could be given at home, it could be given at church. So the basic thing there is systematic instruction that is being given. Now, instruction is given, as I said, in different forms. The question for us is what is Christian education? 
if we know that education is giving systematic instruction, then it must mean that there is an education that has a specific focus. Therefore, Christian education means that it is an education that has Christ at the center. It means that they take the values. There is a lot of philosophy about education. You can think about different philosophies of education. But the philosophy that we take as a Christian is a philosophy that takes the values that has been exposed by Christ. Now, one of the things that it is essential to understand about Christian education is upholding the values, the morals that is actually espoused in the Bible or in the Christian beliefs. So when we're talking about Christian education, we are talking about an education that wants to restore man into the image of God. When God created man, he created him in his own image. But sin came and disfigured the, that relationship and even the image of God. So one of the purposes of education is to restore man. In Adventism, actually, we are talking about restoring the image of man the way God wanted him to have. And so in a nutshell, what we, when we are talking about Christian education, we are saying that we have different philosophies of education the purpose of education, and I just want to read just one text just to illustrate what I mean by the Christian education. And I want to invite you to go with me to the book of Luke. Go with me to the book of Luke, and I'm going to read a very familiar text that I think if we have been attending church, we would have been able to read in our um, kindergarten and every other. The book of Luke, and the chapter is chapter number 2, and I'm going to read for you the verse 52. Um, I believe that you can find it with, with you. And um, Luke 2.52. Um, and it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now there is education that we are interested that is to equip us for eternity. So we are talking about, when you talk about Christian education, you are talking about education that equips you for eternity. It also equips you for life here. That's why you read here it says that Christ grew up in wisdom and in stature in favor of God and men. So we are talking about being a useful citizen or being a useful person in this world. In other words, you need to have the skills and the competences you require in this world. But more importantly also, you need to be prepared for eternity. And that's why we're saying that it is an education that focuses on principles of Christ. Amen. Um, Yukabeth, would you want to add anything to that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, from the book of Proverbs, chapter 2, uh, verse 6, it acknowledges that uh, for the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So f for me, the basis of uh, Christian education, uh, the center is God, uh, because it is God who gives wisdom. It is only God who gives knowledge and understanding. So any foundation uh, whose, or whose existence acknowledges that the Lord is the giver of wisdom, the Lord is the giver of knowledge and understanding is very important and it forms a basis for a Christian um, life and a Christian education. So as we are training the children, then we are emphasizing that the Lord is the foundation of this wisdom, knowledge and understanding. So what I'm hearing is that Christian education means Christ-centered education. I don't know if you agree, uh, my, my principal. Thank you. Okay. My approach is different, but we have Christian education and we have Adventist education. All Christians offer, who have schools, they offer education. And they offer for different reasons and purpose. 
You know, education is all about a process in which learners are able to acquire knowledge, skills, and attitudes. But the, the focus is very different from us as Adventists. What, why do we take our children to Adventist schools? All in all, when it comes to Christian education, it means it's offered by Christians in a Christian environment. And this is getting towards molding Christian moral values and Christian principles for each learner. When it comes to Adventist education, I think there might be a difference between Christian education and also Adventist education. There will be a difference between the two. Okay, so that makes it easy for me to ask, then what is Adventist education? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Adventist education is what is offered by Adventist schools. And the foundation of Adventist education is what Elder said in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 52. And it was read like this. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Any Adventist school, any Adventist teacher must be able to fulfill the four needs of a child. And the four needs are here. One, Jesus grew in wisdom. Meaning, if Jesus was in a classroom setup, he was very sharp in class. He was not the last. He was among the first. And our schools must be an example in terms of offering the best academically and shine outside there in our various career. Mm -hmm. Number two, in stature, that Jesus grew physically. Our education, Adventist education, must be able to approach it in terms of holistic. Jesus was able to grow as a healthy child physically. We must have programs in our schools that cater for physical needs of each child. Number three, that Jesus grew in favor with God, first with God. Mm -hmm. It means spiritually. That Jesus was able to know who God is, as Ella said, he was able to restore man in God's image. He was able to know that God is the ultimate source of knowledge and wisdom, and not man, and not teachers. And finally, socially, that Jesus was able to be in favor with man. He was able to relate well with every child, with every elder that was given. When it comes to Adventist education, mm -hmm. allow me to quote the book of Ad Adventist education, page 13, paragraph 1, that Ad Adventist education is holistic in nature. And I read, and I quote, that true education means more than the pursuit of certain course of study. It means more than becoming an engineer, a teacher, a doctor, or even a pilot. It means more than preparation for the life that is now. Most times we take our children to schools, they can be a better person in the future in terms of earning more and having a good life. It's more than that. It has to do with the whole being. We focus more on one side of our learner, but don't focus on the whole child and with the whole period of existence possible to man. It is a harmonious development. This is now the meaning of Adventist education. It is a harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual powers. Then finally, it prepares the student for the service, joy of service in this world, not to be served, but even to feel the joy of serving this world and for the higher joy of wider service in the world to come. We are preparing them for eternity. Adventist education means restoring the children uh, our learners back to God's image and prepare them for the service in this world and prepare them for a wider joy of service in the world to come. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, for some of us who do not uh, enjoy the Adventist education, you're, what you're saying is we are missing out. Yeah? Are we missing out? Because uh, if I take my daughter or my son to school, and they finish, there's no drama, they finish, and they go to the university, they finish, and they get a good job. What is wrong with that? What is wrong with that? And they come to church every Sabbath. And I've, I've not taken them to an Adventist school. Now we are being practical. And, uh, I, you know, what is wrong with that? What, are they, what have they missed? I'm, I'm asking this in, in terms of the role that Adventist uh, education plays in our lives. 
Yes. When I mean by the role of education, Adventist education to our children. I long begin by saying that we have uh, three agencies of education, and each agency has a role to play. Number one, we have left all the responsibility of uh, bringing the child and giving the education to a school teacher. And the parents have delegated the whole responsibility to the, to the teachers. But there are, four main, there are four main agencies of true Adventist education. Number one is the home. Home is the first agency. Learning begins from home, not from school. Many times, we, we, we are on the receiving end, in case a child is not doing well, in terms of character, because we are the one who spends more time with the children. The child is supposed to begin from home, and the parents are supposed to be God-fearing parents. Allow me to say, I heard a wedding announcement today, which is good. And many times, we, we fail to understand that when you're picking a spouse for marriage, you're not just a picking a life partner. You are picking a teacher of your children in life. So whoever doesn't fit to be a teacher of your children, they doesn't qualify to be a spouse in marriage because you are going to begin stabilizing the first agency of education. When the family is good in terms of restoring the image of God in children at home, the teachers in school will have an easy time. In other words, I'm saying here, there must be partnership from home. Number two, the school. The school now takes over the child from age of four onwards. These are called formative years. And we must partner. And the, and the school, if it's an Adventist school, is supposed to partner with the parents on what they are doing at home and complement and supplement in school and not take over from the parents. Number three is the church. When they come to church, they're supposed to do what has been done at home and in school. But in case the parents have done their best at home and the church has done their best, but they are taken to schools where we don't emphasize on holistic children, then you are going to dilute the effort made by the two agencies. And this happens that in the three agencies we are talking about here, they must have one common goal. They must prepare these learners and children for eternity. And therefore, the role of Adventist education is to connect these learners with the Christ. Thank you. Amen. So we've all had viewers online and those that are in church. If you have any comment or any question, please prepare. We'll take your comments. At, uh, uh, we'll let you know when we will take the comments. We are being told that we need to take our children to Adventist schools where they receive holistic education. Now, for those that are in public schools, or even those that are in Adventist schools, is teaching Bible a reserve of only the Bible teachers? And this I want to ask my sister, Yukabeth. Is teaching Bible and anything to do with Bible only a reserve of only those that are uh, Bible teachers? Um, maybe before I comment on that, yes. I want to uh, maybe comment what um, the teacher said. Um, I'm a parent in both uh, high school, uh, high school um, Adventist school and uh, university level. And um, one of the joys when I visit there, like on a Sabbath, uh, to worship with my children is the joy of seeing uh, these young people uh, worshiping God and praising God um, and, you know, unrestricted, even from that young age. And even some of these schools, the experience is really out of this world. They have marvelous bands, they have very good choirs, and... Um, very, very uh, strong. It's building up very, very uh, strong children. Uh, the difference is when some of these children come to the university to us, most of them continue to serve God um, really, really strongly the way they have been raised. 
uh, the, since they have been given a very strong foundation. And it makes a very big difference. Why? Because uh, university itself is a different world uh, with all kinds of freedom. Nobody will teach you anything. But the discipline, the kind of social, especially social discipline they get in the primary and high school Adventist schools helps them navigate uh, the very big challenges uh, that they face in the universities. So to come to your question on um, whether the Bible is reserved uh, for, uh, for the Bible or the teachers, um, I think from the book of um, Matthew, Matthew 5, chapter 14, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 to 16, we are told that we are the light of the world, and you know we cannot uh, actually hide that light. And um, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20, it there is the great commission that therefore go and make disciples of all, all the nations, baptizing them. So it is our responsibility that wherever we are, wherever we are, we need to be the light. And we also have a mission that we need to reach out uh, to everyone to know the Lord. So it doesn't, you don't, really don't have to be a Bible scholar for you to do that. Even the way you live alone is uh, an experience uh, for people to learn from you. Even, even just to get to know the Lord uh, by you getting contact to them. As a teacher, sometimes in a secular place, it's difficult. But then every time I get an opportunity, I have to say the word of the Lord. You know, three hours of teaching is, is, is a lot. Uh, so within those three hours, I normally get an opportunity at least to talk to somebody. And sometimes some of those students come back and say, you know, really what you said is very, very important. What you, you know, I get an opportunity to say everything, including dressing. Because some of them practically come to class almost naked. Then I have to say something like, do you know you are the jewel? Yeah, jewels are not just held here, they are, you know, they are very precious. It's not something just to expose themselves. And some of them, you find they get touched. They change their dressing. I know of one who really had dreadlocks, and um, I kept on talking to him. You know, it makes you look like a girl. You know, I kept on talking to him one-on-one -on -one because he was a class rep. So last year, I found him and he told me, you know, madam, I cut my hair. It was clean. He used to put on earrings. He told me he stopped. He stopped earrings. He stopped. He cut his dreadlocks. He's very clean. In fact, I was very shocked because I just pumped into him. So I think it's a commission to us. We can let spread Christ uh, at every opportunity that we get. Let me, let me add, um, because it is a, an interesting question, because the issue is that we may not get the opportunity to be Bible teachers in our schools, but we get the opportunity to practice what we believe in our schools. Now, that gives us an opportunity as teachers to be able to model what we believe in. So one of the things that I get from the Bible is that we should be all teachers, not necessarily because of the profession that we have taken. Mm. Now, in a public school, you could be that model that talks about Christ in your class. It may not be very explicit. You could even have a session to pray because when you do that, the others will be asking, uh, this teacher does things differently. As um, my panelists were saying, it's even how you adorn yourself. That's the way that you can actually be making your communication. And people and students might want to ask, why are you doing things this way? 
And that is an opportunity for you to explain. And so sometimes you may not have to go in front and say that uh, I want to teach you about Christ, but you have an opportunity to explain why you believe in Christ because of what you do. And I, I just want to probably also read something that is very familiar to us, that um, it is also that our responsibility as even parents to be teachers. And I'm reading to you what is very common, which is in the book of Exodus. And you find it, is, this is the story of Moses. And I want to refer to you to Exodus chapter 2, and I'll read just verse 9 and verse 10. This is very, very clear for us that when you are given the people or children in the formative years, this is the best time you can influence them. If you miss this opportunity, it becomes very difficult to influence them in the future. And so, even at any opportunity in church or at home, you have this opportunity that was given, and I read in, um, this is um, Exodus, I'm reading chapter 2, verse 9. It says, Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, and the her here refers to the mother of Moses, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And then verse 10, And the child grew, and she brought him to, Pharaoh, to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. Now, this was something that she did for about 12 years. And the impact was lifelong. So, when we have an opportunity, especially even in our schools, and we might be interacting with the young ones, we may think that is not the best time. It is indeed the best time to only, not only teach them about the wisdom of this world, but also to teach them about the reasons why we believe in what we believe. And if we do that, we get an opportunity to be even instructors when we are not in church schools or when we do not do the, the CRE or those lessons. Thank you. I also wanted to find out in Adventist schools, do, is it a reserve only of the Bible? Do we have challenges also with teachers in Adventist schools who may direct a student to another? Is it a, is it a problem as it is in, in a public school? Okay, thank you. The issue of teaching Bible is not a, a reserve for few of teachers because for you to get a chance to teach in Adventist school then you must be qualified that you are fully connected with the Christ as Elder said eh, the best teacher is setting a good example to our children and if someone is not well found in the scriptures he or she may end up diluting the effort that has been done by the church by the school and by the home it's not a reserve for Bible teachers. And I know in most schools, eh, because of the modern times, when we want to get into academic performance only, at the expense of prayer and Bible times, we are diluting, and that must be very cautious taken. We need to ensure that our teachers are gifted differently in manner in which we are able to teach the Bible, but we are supposed to ensure that every teacher has a chance to ensure they're able to share out to the best of their knowledge. So, in the school's interviews, we must consider that teachers who are strong in faith and are qualified to teach become the best qualified to teach in our schools because the mission is higher than we think about it. Then number two, we should encourage our teachers to carry out their personal Bible study because you can only share what you know. You can only share what you study. You can only share what you have practiced in life. Therefore, if we, do, if we miss to do our personal studies, we'll have, we have nothing to share with our children. But the moment I continue developing a lifestyle of Bible study and prayer life in my prayer life, it means I will impact the same to a young ones. I will only be able to reflect what I have. I can't give what I don't have. So let's practice what we can give to others because they have been given um, 
many hours in our, in our custody. Teachers take more time with the learners more than parents. If you give your child to a teacher who don't care about spiritual needs, physical needs, social needs, academic needs of your child, then most likely you're going to have a child who is going to compromise many principles in life. There's a need also a teacher to be holistic, just like the child. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm just thinking, okay, I know that when you are going, uh, when you're asked to be a teacher in an Adventist school, there are some credentials that you must have. You must be a seven-day Adventist, meaning you are well standing. From other perspectives apart from you, I want to ask you, Kabeth, do you think there are challenges that Adventist schools face in education today? Because I know we expect the Adventists to have, not to have any challenges because they are Adventists, they, are, they know the Bible, they are taught the Bible, they breathe the Bible. Some of us went through Adventist school, some of us have children who have gone through Adventist school. Are there challenges in Adventist school? Um, thank you very much. I'll first go to the book of uh, Second Timothy, chapter 3. It says, but know this, that in the last days, pernicious times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, uh, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, and thankful, and holy, and loving, and forgiving, and slanderers, without self-control, brutal, uh, despisers of good, traitors. So it lists a number of them. So some of these uh, challenges, or they are not unique even to Adventist institutions. Uh, Adventist institution, I'm not only talking about schools, we are talking about uh, hospitals, a number of, there are over 7,000, I think, institutions that are as dear affiliated. So if you look at these last days, uh, some of these things, you still find them in, even in Adventist schools. One good example, um, my daughter is in an Adventist school, and uh, when we recently went there for a class conference, one of the things they were saying is there is high lesbianism, even in that particular school. And one of the shocks, I'm like, really? Yeah, but you see, this is the last days. Those things will always be there. Gayism is also a big thing. These queer characters, very unruly children. I remember when um, one of the opening days, uh, the, the list is very clear. Don't come with curly hair. Don't come with nails polished. But there are still students who came during opening with very long nails, very curly hair, uh, lipstick, you know, very, very weird things. So some of these issues are really there. So the first challenge is uh, in terms of social challenges, um, the ones we found out there and outside Adventist schools are also creeping in into Adventist schools. So it's something that um, most probably the administration may have to work very hard. Another challenge is um, there is a perception that generally Adventist schools are very expensive. So if there is a general perception, and it is uh, weird that has Adventists are the ones with that feeling. Because when you go to some of these schools, they are actually attracting quite a big number of non-Adventists. Because they have discovered to raise good children take them to Adventist schools. So in some of these schools, even where my daughter is, there are a number of Muslims. A number of Muslims there, a number of Catholics, and a number of other people from other religions. And it's a national school. So you can imagine how people are very happy to take their children to an Adventist school when us, we are actually shying away, saying that it is, um, they're very expensive. But when you do comparison, maybe the teacher will tell us, when I compare Riara and uh, MAPS, actually MAPS is much cheaper. And they get more. 
they benefit more from the Christian foundation. But Riera is more expensive, much, much more than that. So that perception, I think it's something we need to look at. Uh, people view like Baraton is very expensive, but the fees is as comparable to what actually public schools, public universities charge nowadays. So it's, it's just the same. In fact, even public, um, the job system of admission is actually taking uh, students' placement to some of these institutions, including Baraton. You are, you've been admitted by the government, but you are placed in, in Baraton. So it is comparable. But that perception, I think, is something uh, that is really, really a big notion out there. And uh, lastly, uh, personally, I was in administration for a very long time uh, before circumstances forced me to move to teaching. Uh, for close to 14 years, I was in administration. So the politics, uh, the politics are there, even including the church actually, I think, really even affects the day, -to -day running of the management of these schools and which can be also a challenge. Maybe the teacher will tell us, but I know uh, uh, that politics is a big thing. So it really affects. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe Elder can read some of the comments or questions that we have from on the, uh, the online viewers before we give um, one or two questions. Uh, from those who have them in, in the in church, in the uh, congregation. Yeah, I have questions already that has been shared with us online. Um, I think there are about four. Can I read the first one? It says, can, uh, it's from Sharon. It says, can you explain why in most cases of sexual immorality usually come from Christian fam families? What is the take of the church in this, yet we have invested heavily in Bible education to our children. That's the first question. Uh, can I go to the second one? So let me go to the second one. This is from Caroline. And she says, I'm a parent and a an high school teacher. What form of rebuking can I use to correct a student, in, in this case, a rebellious student? Who doesn't want to change? Um, there are others here. Um, says, uh, Samson says, uh, sometimes as um, a teacher of international school where there is a lot of children rights, what do you do in case of a rebellious child? So it's a similar question. Um, and then there is another one which says, um, this is also from Samson says, where the parent refuses his or her child to be rebuked or corrected. So what do you do when a uh, the parent refuses to, uh, for a child to be corrected? Um, yeah, so those are um, the questions that I've seen so far. The first one to the principal. Why is there immorality in schools? Did they call it immorality? Uh, sexual, immorality. sexual immorality. When we have invested so heavily in our, you know, in our schools, there is, you know, teachers who are Christians. We teach Christian curriculum. We integrate Christian um, curricula. Why do we have immorality more in Christian schools? Thank you for the question. The fact remains that we are still in this world. Adventist schools are still in the planet Earth does not mean that these Adventist schools are somewhere which is free from temptations. As the Bible says, the fight we are fighting is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and the power of the spiritual darkness. We are fighting a war. The devil knows very well that if these children have been taught about Christian principles, Adventist values, they are still exposed to many temptations and many trials in their lives. Just the way sometimes we have a perception that pastors' children 
are not disciplined. Elders' children are not well behaved. Deacons and deaconess' children are badly behaved. Sometimes it is a perception. Where you take an example of a child of a child of one elder and you make generalization to every elder in the church. These children are not safe. Now they are in Adventist schools. And what I said, eh, there must be a strong partnership between the home, the parents, the teachers in school, and the church. Because when they come home, do they have bad influences that they take to school? Do they take some bad influences from school to home? Do they take some bad influences from church and they take to home and, and, and schools? They do that. My work is to say this. Even though they have been trained, the Bible says, train up your child in the way he should go. And when he is old up, he will not depart from it. It means our work is to lay firm foundation and have a strong partnership between teachers, parents, and the church members. But when we leave it to one person on one side, then you have a compromise. Number two, Adventist schools admit all types of children of different religions and faith, of different backgrounds. It cannot take within a day to change a person, even you or myself. I have no change. I'm seeing the process of changing. You don't expect an overnight process for a child who has come from different backgrounds to change. But an effort has been made through prayers and an effort to ensure these children have been brought up in the right way. It is a war we are fighting, but Christ shall win for us. Thank Amen. You. Amen. Yes. I want to add also that it's also possible to go through education but do not be able to learn. So you can go through a system, but the system does not change you. So it is possible that you can be in Adventist school, but you are not converted. It's also possible that you are a Christian by name, but you are not converted. So it is possible that some of the things that we see is because of lack of conversion. God still gives us the free will to make our choices. So you can still go through Adventism education, but you are not still converted. So the idea is that you give your learners the best opportunity to make the right choices. So it is not like that because you have gone through Adventism, by default, it's a linear relationship. It means that as an individual, God holds you responsible for your own decisions. But we want to give you the best opportunity. That opportunity is for you to know Christ. And therefore, you have to make your own decision about that Christ. So that's why sometimes you could be also in the church, but you are not a believer. But you are called an Adventist because you are attending uh, services of Adventism. But that does not make you to be an Adventist in truth because you have not been able to be converted. And so sometimes we look at this issue of immorality and we are saying there is a lot of immorality within a Christian setting. But these are mostly people who have not been converted. But they want to take the form of Christianity. But they have not taken Christ himself. So that's what, um, one of the additions I just wanted to make. Okay. Um, uh, maybe to add on that, uh, the, the Bible is clear. The work of the devil is cut out. His work is to kill, to destroy. Uh, so uh, the only problem with us human beings is when you are a Christian, you are, a, you are always looked from a lens. People want to monitor every kind of move. So these things, it's not only that they are in Adventist schools or Christian settings. They are all out there. Like when we had a fight in Maxwell, we were all over the news. But how many churches fight? But the only thing, the unique thing is we're saying, rarely do Adventists fight. So what is happening? So the the thing is, the devil is there. And sometimes um, the only thing, if he wants to destroy a church, first is to destroy a family and also destroy marriages. So that is why you see uh, the way children behave, uh, the way people are behaving even in marriage, that is the work of the devil. 
So the, but the only good thing is the grace of God is sufficient. And is the only one who can do, who can save us from all those things, even our children. And uh, the congregation at large, you can see that we have challenges, a lot of challenges in Adventist schools. Not only Adventist schools, in schools in general. A question here is how will our Adventist schools in their Adventist education address the addition of LGBTQ in the curriculum? How? I knew this was going to come. <laughs> and yeah, yes, we knew this was going to come because these are the challenges that we are going through in, the, in our Christian education today. I don't know who wants to answer this. How um, do we address the addition of LGBTQ in the curriculum? I can start and then my, my teacher uh, can also come in. Mm. Um, the, in education, there is what's called curriculum. Curriculum is what you teach. It's what you, has been approved for teaching. And there is, of course, different education systems that we, we follow in the world. So you can't be able to say you are following 844 system or the CPC system, and it has a set of curriculum. Now, it is at times those curriculums may be at variance with what is in the Word of God. And at times also schools choose which curriculum they take. Now, our rule of learning is that we are going to take the Bible as supreme. In our Christian education or in our Adventist education, we take that everything that is not in conformity with the Bible is not true education. So true education or true knowledge is anything that is in conformity with the Bible. Therefore, in our schools, we cannot teach anything that is contrary to what is in the word of God. Now, there are many things that is being advocated by the various groups or various countries or various curriculum, and some of it come in the form of human rights. Now, the human rights is taught that you make choices. Now, the Bible teaches us that actually there is, well, let me go back one step. There is also the, the feeling in the world that there is uh, somewhat called relative truth. And there is anything that you say is compared to others. But we have the standard that the Bible is the truth. And therefore, we cannot be basing things on things that are not based on the truth. And so, when you talk of human rights, you are talking of human rights in relation to others. But when you talk about the human rights in relation to the Bible, then the Bible has the truth. And therefore, these things of LBQQT and plus, plus, plus that is coming mm -hmm. is not biblical. Mm. When it is not biblical, it is not what we stand for as Adventists in education. Mm. It is contrary. We do not agree with it. We do not believe in it. And we do not advocate for it. And therefore, we uphold what the Bible is. So the question is for us, where do you want to take your children do you want to take your children to a place where they accept these other issues and teach them? One of the things that is also very pervasive is that they also teach other things like evolution. Okay? And that is one of the basis that tells you God is not a creator. Now, once you begin to believe in that, you're opening a Pandora's box for anything to be relative. So if you teach that God is the creator, then it also means you are teaching that there is something called Sabbath, and there is something called God, and there is something that is right and wrong. The issue of human rights is to say that there is nothing wrong or right. But we know from the Bible there is absolute truth, and the absolute truth is Jesus Christ. Amen. So the advantage of an Adventist education or go, taking our children to Adventist school is there is control at some point, especially where curricula is concerned. Yes, we will go through these challenges. Just like in our church, there are things that happen 
even in the midst of prayer and fasting and coming to church. But that does not stop us from coming to church. We must continue believing in the Lord. And I want to believe that the principle, as he said, these things happen, but we will not give up. Let's take our children to schools where we know that they will fight. And you, as the teacher who is teaching there, you, the back stops at you. Teach, shine, let your light shine at home, in, the place, in your place of work. Because we have been told education is not just in school. It's not confined only to school. It starts at home. Con fight this battle because that battle is there. Somebody said that these things are happening. They're increasing now because the time is nigh. It is happening more now than it used to, be, be, to happen before. The time is nigh. We need to fight. Um, as we come to the end of our discussion, I want to, I know some, we have talked about this, but I want each one of us to talk about, um, as a church, how we can overcome these challenges. I know we've said a few, but if we have some that we want to add, these challenges are there. How as, can we, as a church today, corporately and members of church, fight these challenges that we have, whether it is in Adventist schools or public schools, how do we fight it? I'll start with you and then we'll go to Elder and we finish with you, Kabeth. Thank you. Allow me to address the issue of uh, LGBTQ+. Oh. The matter is now at our doorstep. We thought it's an American and uh, European affair, but it is infiltrating into our country step by step. Recently, you heard the announcement made by the Supreme Court, and this is a, a sign of bad times to come. The, man, the Adventist Church is not 100% involved in curriculum development. It's done by the KICD. Yeah. And the developers are not purely Adventist educators, but they are mainly in terms of secular content. And there are times when they are influenced by external forces to infiltrate some content into our books. And this is above us as Adventists because we are supposed to use the, the, the books approved by KICD. It's illegal for you to use a book which is not legalized by the KICD. And where does now the ball fall on our side? If I take that textbook that has a content that has the LGBTQ matter, that teacher who is an Adventist is supposed to filter what is supposed to be given to the learners. But we have someone who the matter is about syllabus coverage and the content covered and preparation for KCP and uh, other examinations. Most likely, they are going to compromise our standards and our principles. Who handle your child? Who give content to your child in 10 hours every week, every day? Times five, who handle your child 50 hours in a week? What do they give your children? Recently, parents, it's good to be very careful in terms of the storybooks we give to our children to, to read. Many times, we buy a book because it's hardly shillings. Cheap are expensive. And we have not even read that textbook or the storybook. You just see a book in the supermarket or in the textbook center. And you buy them, you want them to become uh, fluent in reading and in English and so on. But the content is, is, is amazing. It's a risk to the child. Parents, I encourage you, whatever you give to your child, please make a point of reading through those books. Whatever you can digest as a parent, recommend it to your children. When they come back home in, from school, there are times when they get books from their, from their friends, and they are told, read this book. And they say, you reading. Do you, need, do you mind about getting to know what type of book is it they are reading? What kind of programs do they watch on the TV? Do they have a TV the whole day, parents? What kind of an environment have you created for your children? You may be, you may be nurturing an LGBTQ in your house, not even from school. Depending on the environment you have put your child, either at home, either in church, or even in school. I know it's a matter sometimes that's beyond us, but when your children go back, to, when they go to school, do like Job. 
sanctify them and pray for them. They may be away from you. You don't know who was, who connected with their child when they were in school. Who was making close interaction with them? Which teacher was able to hand them? Is he a lesbian? Is he a homosexual, a drug addict? Who don't care about the children's affairs and so on? You must keep them in prayers. The Lord may sanctify them as they continue. Other challenges that we have in our, in our Adventist schools is number one, as Madam said, we have no power to integrate faith and learning. You see the topic of evolution is in class eight. It is a topic that must be taught. Now, how do you bring an aspect of faith and learning in an area that is compromising our faith? An Adventist teacher who is so wise enough will make a difference between what archaeologists believe in and what God talks about creation story. It's not about passing exams. It's about preparing them for eternity. So, kuna issue about uh, integrating faith and learning in them. Number two, kuna the issue, of course, as Madam said. Some believe that Adventist schools are very expensive. But how come our schools are filled by an Adventist? Are you saying Adventist, uh, we are poor to afford higher education? In the world, are able to afford? Sometimes it's perception that uh, our schools are very expensive. If they are expensive, then I tell this church. Every church is supposed to have a school where they are the ones who are supposed to, to determine the amount of school fees to be paid by each learner. I'm explaining that this church very soon is supposed to have a school where the fees is determined by the board who is made up by the members of this church. In that case, you will have a way to regulate the amount of school fees paid to the parents. But let me tell you, cheap is expensive. Ask yourself, how much are you paying as a school fees? Is it worth? Is it value? Is it adding value to your child? Then the last three is politics. They are mostly in our, in our churches, in our schools, where, where nepotism and tribalism is taking root. Why you want to employ your cousin, you want to employ your brother, you want to employ a person from your village, you want to employ someone from your church, and so forth, without meeting the, the laid-down qualifications. So we need to be careful that we may not be like the world. We must state ourselves clearly that whoever is supposed to teach in our Adventist schools must be someone who will add value, eternal value, to our children. Thank you. Amen. Do you have anything to add? Um, uh, thank you very much. There is someone who asked about uh, discipline. Uh, discipline issues, I think as teachers, uh, this day is something to be careful about. Um, you cannot beat somebody's child. Uh, you cannot insult. Uh, so those are things. But in some of these schools, uh, these days, they are encouraging having counselors. Uh, spiritual counselors or um, patrons who can deal, who, ca who such cases can be referred to. Even within teaching profession, we have those who, who work as counselors, so it is important uh, that if you have such kind of cases, you refer them within uh, the counseling department or the patrons who can be able to deal with with that professionally. Otherwise, I'll caution somebody uh, disciplining somebody's child uh, these days. And um, I just want to add what uh, the teacher said. Uh, the church needs to be actively involved in education, and I want to thank the church. I think they're doing amazing work in chaplaincy, in schools, and even campus ministries. It's very very, very important. And even as individual members, if you can find a way of getting involved, some of us, we call it giving back, giving back to society. Have even your extra time to visit some of these schools, uh, children's homes, just to give your volunteer service. It is quite important. We've done, I'm in a group where we do a lot of such voluntary work, all the way from Kajiado, Machakos, all the way to Maraquet. 
And I think recently we did one in Sironga where my daughter is with Beatrice, Dr. Kiage. And we just gave a talk during in the afternoon, just as a way of uh, reaching out uh, to some of these uh, students. And I can tell you the kind of things these children go through. Some of them go through a very difficult challenges, even at home, that actually affect uh, their performance, even in school. Very, very deep issues, including even sexual abuse at home. And they're even scared of actually going back to their homes during the holidays. That is how bad it is. So if you can find a way of being involved at the church level and even at individual level, uh, that would be great. One of the things, uh, one of the challenges that we have, especially in the SDS school, is the funding. They are actually really underfunded. I don't know whether that is true, but I know they are really underfunded. And you can see the struggle, even in terms of the facilities that they have. If you compare what the Catholic schools have and what the Adventist schools, it's not comparable. They have state-of-art facilities, including equipment, uh, which are not there. But you see, those are funded mostly by the church. So if we can find a way, the church can find a way of uh, helping, assisting some of these schools. And I know, like last year, we were struggling to uh, fund Baraton to build a hall of something, an ICT room, really big money, which is not there. So if we can find a way of assisting, then that would be very good. Amen. Just to say that um, very briefly, two things for me. The first one is put things in the right perspective. Put God first, and God says that if you put me first, all other things will be added unto you. Sometimes we put things in the wrong order by probably thinking more of academic achievements rather than uh, considering the eternity. So if you put things in perspective, that will be the right thing. Put God first, and then the other things will be good. The second point for me is in terms of, as a church, get involved. Get involved as a member. Be part of and parcel of raising the children around you. You can be a mentor. You can be a supporter. Go and also be a teacher at the kindergarten or any other when you have an opportunity. Be involved. Be also be involved in Adventist schools. Because if you sit outside and criticize from outside, you are not helping. Be inside and help from inside. That's the way the schools can grow. And that's how we can grow even our children and even the future. I want to thank our panelists very much for taking their time to discuss the, our challenges and issues that affect us in the Christian education. One thing I'm taking home is I love the fact that as a teacher, the buck stops with me. Even if it is integrated in the curriculum, I can use that opportunity to speak God to a child. Parents, take the challenge at home. Talk to them about this uh, LGBTQs plus plus plus. Don't shy away from them. Ask them what, they are, what it is, what they are being taught, because we cannot uh, control those that uh, develop the curriculum, but we can control what we tell our children. Let's continue praying. Let's continue talking to our children and support our schools. May God bless you. I want to take, you want, I want to take this opportunity to ask uh, my sister Yukabet to finish with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, this afternoon. We want to praise your name. Thank you, Lord, for this session and for giving us this opportunity uh, to share uh, whatever we have shared. May your will be done. And where we have wronged, Lord, we ask for forgiveness so that this prayer may be acceptable to you. Bless us now and forevermore because we pray in Jesus' name. I also want to thank uh, the members who have commented, those that have asked questions. And I know they are mainly for making this uh, panel what it is. May God bless you. Thank you.